to How She Quits. It's Lori Mercer, and this is another interview in our series of interviewing moms who have left a Monday through Friday workplace job and who now work for themselves. And you can download our free step-by-step -step guide at howshequits.com if you are looking to be one of those women. Um, today we are talking to Seneca Evans, who is the founder of simplifiedaccount.com. So she is actually my online accountant. If you didn't even know you could have one of those, it's fabulous. <laughs> um, I was drowning, like that is not my gift. And I was drowning in that space in my small business and um, went out to my online network of groups and people I'm connected to. And that's how Seneca and I connected. Um, so we can talk more about that. Like how do you network online later? But Seneca, welcome and thank you. And it's great to have you. Well, yes, thank you for having me, Lori. This is it's gonna be fun, I'm excited. Good, okay, well, let's start with like the mom stuff because I always like to hear that because it sort of sets people's expectations up and um, I have four kids, right? So I always get the whole, oh my gosh, how do you do this with four kids? Well, you have four kids too. So tell us about your, your family and your life and your business a little bit. Okay, perfect. Well, I have four kids, um, I have four boys. My youngest is nine months. My oldest is 12 years old. So I still have little kids. Um, I work from home. I've been in business for, I'm going to start my sixth year. And I've been working at home the entire time. And it's been fun. It's been challenging. It's been exciting. It's been all of those things wrapped into one big ball. For sure. I always tell people like, like, I love it. I have the dream, but it is also the hardest thing I've ever done. So just yeah. be ready for what you're getting into, right? Um, yes, be ready for anything and everything. So what were you doing before you started this work? Okay, so I like to say I was on the other side. I worked for the government. I was a tax auditor. And then right before I left, I was a criminal investigator for tax crimes. So I was that person that everybody hated. I came and I shut down small businesses. I gave you huge liabilities. It was, I ruined people's lives for a living. It was terrible. <laughs> it just it did not set well with me at all. So then I made a decision after doing that for several years. I decided I was, I'm going to switch sides. I'm going to help small business owners avoid me because it was terrible. I mean, can you imagine having to go to someone's home and arrest them in front of their kids? Mm -hmm. taxes it was it was terrible no and this is why I have you because see like if she was on the other side guys then she knows how to really keep you away from that right so exactly. I, usually like I, I you know when we're doing because you do our nonprofit finances and that's super super important to me that we are just on the up and up entirely with our nonprofit so to have somebody mm -hmm. like you know and keep me like safe and protected like I'm not doing anything wrong, but you know, you just, if you don't do the paperwork right, it might look like you're doing something wrong, right? So exactly. that's exactly. what I mean. so important. The, the little things can turn into humongous, massive things, and you didn't even have the intent to do that or just a mistake, and they can turn your life and your business upside down. All right, so we've thoroughly scared everybody right now into needing your <laughs> services, which is perfect because <laughs> Fear-based marketing, as sad as it is, it sort of works. It really works. <laughs> oh, I like to do fear-based with like the gentle, like mothering, like, it's okay, we're going to help you, right? <laughs> All right, no, she's not scary. It's been great working with her. Um, okay, so, but you have a, an interesting twist on your story because, you know, I like to talk to like women who are in their job, usually they're like, how am I going to transition that? Like it's paycheck, 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 and then you know, when the money, when you're earning your own money and paying yourself your own paycheck, like that just doesn't materialize overnight usually. And you didn't have the luxury of doing any like off ramp, on ramp kind of strategy because you can't be both an auditor and an accountant at the same time. So like you just said, you jumped in with two feet. So tell like, how did that transition go? And like, tell us all, you know, like all of it, the scary parts, the, the joyous parts, like how did that go? Well, it was extremely scary. I think it was one of the scariest things that I've ever done in my life because it's a huge conflict of interest, right? So I couldn't just go to work and then build my business on the side, which is ideal. I had to make a decision, I had to plan everything and then say, okay, I'm going to jump in. So the day I quit, it was May 31st, was my last day. And the next day, June 1st, I was so excited. 
I didn't have to get up and go to work. I didn't have to do all these things. I mean, it was because I was an investigator. I carried a gun on my hip and I had to do the whole safety thing with that and the vest. And I was so glad to let go of that part of it. So I was relieved. Like I was on vacation. And you then know, That's so funny. I got to make a comment about that because I think I need to write a blog on this or something. It's like with that first day that you're not at your job, you almost need a detox. Like, oh my gosh, I don't have to put that on anymore. I don't have to wear those clothes. You mean I don't have to report at any time? Like it took me actually a couple of months of like detoxing from my day job when I was working from home. So yeah, that is, that feeling is amazing. And I love how everybody, everybody remembers the date and like, you just remember the details of those moments. Like I went to the grocery because I could, because I never went to the grocery on a Monday morning at 10 a.m. And exactly. <laughs> my family had dinner that night. My goodness. <laughs> exactly. I turned the TV on in the middle of the day. I'm like, wow, this is what's on? <laughs> yeah, that's enough. <laughs> I'm caught up right now. <laughs> oh, okay, oh, so, yeah. so you, you got up. It felt like a vacation day. And then? Then reality started sinking in. Okay, I think it was about day three. I, I vacationed for those first two. So day three, it was like, uh-oh, I need to get, get to busy. I, I got things that's going on. And because I planned it, so I had a half a year before tax season hit. So I said, I got to get busy. I got to get marketing out there. And then it turned into, it's like, it almost became an obsession. So I had to jump in and I had to move quick and figure things out very quick. So I, that's what I did. I just jumped right in. I got my licensing. I had to go through all these different steps because I couldn't do it when I was still with the government. Yeah. So I'm really starting from zero. So I had to get all of this stuff up and running and so I can be ready for tax season. And the scariest part was just, of course, I planned for it financially so I can cover my bills. But the scariest part is as I was living and going through and the money was dwindling and it's like, oh my God, am I going to really be able to do this? Mm -hmm. Is this going to work? Am, am I good enough? You know, that imposter syndrome started sneaking up mm -hmm. and it scared me. And at that time I held, I had two kids, just my, my two oldest ones. And they were, um, they were four, how old were they? They were like five or six or six and seven, mm -hmm. somewhere right there. And I had to provide for them. I had to, you know, I had to make it work. So that was the scariest part, but that was my motivation to make it happen by any means. Cause I, when I left, I was like, I'm never coming back here. I don't care what happens. I'm never coming back. Yeah. So I had to I, make it happen. That's like the nightmare, right? For like, once you leave corporate, my husband and I have this conversation. I'm like, if something happened and I needed to provide for the family and it was the last chance, like it literally now is the last thing I would choose to go back to a Monday through Friday day job. So I, you know, part of me sometimes like I'm not bashing the Monday through Friday day jobs because they feed a lot of people and they provide good jobs. And it's, and there are a lot of people that that's totally who it's for. And, but once you leave and have an opportunity to run your own business, right. For me, it's like, that's the last thing. That's like the last straw that we would turn to. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, no way I can do it. I'm going to figure it out before I do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're super motivated by your, your two little ones and providing for them. And, and um, so you had some savings put away so that you could kind of have that season. And you, you did, while you weren't working on your business while you're there, you had a plan and, right, I had a plan. Plan and, and yeah, you did some really smart things. So yeah, it's not just like quit without an idea, right? Cause no. yeah, <laughs> you, you have, an idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Okay. All right. So Tell us then, so you knew you were heading towards tax season, like that was what was going to be your first product offer, right? That you're going to do primarily taxes for people. Um, and so how long until you really like had your first client? Um, well, I had my first client about three months later and it was a bookkeeping client and he's still my client today. I love him dearly. Mm -hmm. It was bookkeeping and then that turned into taxes and then just taking care of everything for his small business. So that was such an exhilarating rush when he came and it was from, from running cost per click ads on Google and he clicked it and loved it. So it was the coldest, coldest lead you could ever get. <laughs> so that was really exciting for me. Like, wow, this wasn't from my warm market. This was somebody searching 
for an accountant on the internet. Yeah. So that really confirmed that I can do this. Yeah. I can do it. It works. It works. And that is interesting too, because I think sometimes when we reach out into our, our warm market, it's almost harder than um, sort of starting to advertise out into the cold market because, because of your mental thing. Like I think the way I present myself to people that already know me is different than, than how I present myself in a, and here's my services and let's have a conversation about how I can help you. Right. 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 Exactly. I can't put, I can't put my finger on that yet, except that I think it really just is some mental blockers we have with, with the, you know, past and history and things that go on in our brain, right? Exactly. Uh, so that's awesome. So you, so you were three months to your first client and by, so, so now I feel like it's a cliffhanger. So when tax season hit, were you like, did you have a bunch of clients in the queue or were there still sort of peaks and valleys? There were still peaks and valleys. I did have a lot more than what I anticipated. I just, I shot extremely low in my projections for the first year and I did exceed them. I th- I think I had about 25 clients my first tax season. So just coming out the gate and not working at a traditional CPA firm, you know, coming where I couldn't, my clients couldn't follow me. So that was really exciting and it built a lot of momentum for me. Well, and plus this was what, this was in 19, 19, oh my gosh, I'm not (laughs) right. (laughs) Guys, I'm 44. The 1900s were, you know, like in my lifetime. (laughs) This was in like 2000, what, it was 12? Two th- yes, 2012. Okay. So, you know, Facebook was different than social media was different than like how you marketed and found clients was very, very different then. So 25 is phenomenal. Yes. Yes. That's why I was like, this is awesome. I think I projected 10. So I was happy that I was able to exceed my goals. And half of those were cold leads that converted. So that. That was really awesome. There were no Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups and Pinterest. And it was just cost per click and you're joining directories. Perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's just, oh, there's so many good questions to ask, but while we're on that top, <clears throat> excuse me, on that topic, let's talk about this like online networking, how you and I connected, we connected through a Facebook group. It took us both a second to be like, now which group was that that we were in? Oh yeah, it was that one. <laughs> right. Um, but really, um, it's, it's like networking, but it's like speed dating networking and you can s- kind of stalk or creep on people and be like, do I want them for a client or not? You know, should I pursue them? It's, it's amazing. And is that how all your business comes now as well? Or are you still doing some like some paid ads as well. I do do more paid ads and um, I'm more into referrals since my client base has built up a lot of referrals with from my client base, which are more warm leads. Um, Facebook does still bring me leads, but I find I'm doing more help. I guess it's my way of giving back now. It seems to turn a lot of new people there and a lot of great questions. So being able to offer them that free guidance that they would not really know where to go turn to it is it's a good feeling yeah yeah exactly so um that's a really good point because you know i'm a big advocate of women who have professional skills like you have in in the accounting space the audit space and like i have in the technology space of being able to you know move into a freelance kind of position and you know, when you look at the um, internet for finding leads, there's so much noise out there about, oh, you have to have a Pinterest and you have to have a Facebook and you have to have a YouTube and it starts to feel overwhelming. The nice thing about building a business this way is your transition from corporate to your own job is that referrals really work. Like these are really referral-based businesses. Like I, you know, I've told a number of people about you, um, you know, when you're just starting, you don't think about needing this and then they grow a little bit and they're like, I'm so, I'm totally overwhelmed by my QuickBooks. And I'm like, I got a girl, (laughs) I got a girl for you. Um, So I found that myself and this is advice for those who are are looking to take this business path. Don't get overwhelmed by having to over market because once you get a few and get that client base rolling, um, you can really rely on referrals in a big way in these service-based businesses. So that's awesome that you do that. Absolutely. It's a great way. Good. Um, okay. So let's see. Let's see. 
Um, what was, so to, let's talk about this. What were some of the most valuable resources that you found and used while you were building your business? Like if somebody's just thinking of going in this direction and like, what were some of the things you did there in that first six months that, that were tools you use or techniques or anything that, that really inspired you? Well, I read a lot. Um, I haven't quite met my goal of the, the one book a week for the whole year, but I do read a lot and I read a, whatever I'm struggling with. I find a book that matches that. And then what I did too, before I left, because of my position, I was always seeing the inside of people's businesses. And I was talking to their accountants and seeing how those accountants ran their business. And I was able to basically doing research when nobody knew I was researching of how businesses ran, what they struggled with, how the accountants ran their business, what were their, their weaknesses, what were their strengths. And I would write notes when I came home. I didn't use Evernote then, but I had notebooks everywhere. <laughs> I would write down my little notes. Okay, I liked how this person did that. And I like how this business owner put this together and uses this technology. So coupled that with the information from the books, from the people who've already done it, I had all of these call them resources that I created to pull from to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then if something came up, I'm like, oh, I saw that at ABC business. Let me look at my notebook and kind of see how they, how they fix that. So it was a lot of research. But but it came were, yeah. Well, and you're really tapping into like, that's so insightful of you because I think even when I was in the corporate world and I write about this in, in the step-by-step -step workbook um, at howshequits.com, I totally was not aware of how valuable my skill set was outside of that corporate world. And it's a little bit about how the workplace is designed, right? Like they want, like they've got you and they want to keep you and they just want to keep you focused on like doing well for them. And you have to sometimes dig really hard to, to have sort of a um, perspective of where your skills rank in the general workplace. So um, one of the pieces of advice I like to give is exactly what you did. You were like, you were aware that um, I have these types of skills and I have this vast resource in front of me while I'm doing my job right now that I need to document. Like I need to be knowing like, cause I'm going to flip to the other side. Right. So like, what are the systems that are working for them? How are they doing a good job of tracking their their whatever mileage, whatever, right? Like all those details that are your world, not mine. <laughs> I'm just imagining. Um, and, you know, so if we pick somebody like, oops, I'm so sorry, that was supposed to be on mute. <laughs> if I pick somebody like a lady who emailed me this week, who is an auditor in the corporate world, she said, well, I'm not an accountant. How does that, how do those skills transfer? And my advice was to say, well, what do people come to you for? They probably come to you because you're orderly, you get stuff done on time, you are a, a whiz with Excel. I, I, I didn't even know her, I'm like, I, you probably are a whiz with Excel, way more than you realize that you are. So right. how do you pull, you know, rec, start to recognize where your strengths are, and then you repackage them into services that you offer, you know, outside the corporate walls. So that is super, super insightful for you. Um, but I have to see my stack of books back here, right? I, I'm an avid reader also. Um, I don't know many successful entrepreneurs who aren't readers, um, unless they're podcast listeners or audiobook listeners. And I still count that as reading, by the way. <laughs> um, <Nice. laughs> it is, it counts. What, um, like, what were your top three, like back then in that season, were, were there any like everybody's got to read these books and I'll put them in the show notes because book re referrals are always my favorite. Okay. Um, I can't remember the author, but the book is called the one thing. Yes. I can't remember the author either, but I have read that book and it's fabulous. It is. I loved it. I think I've read it three times, especially in that first, that first, I think of 2013 was when I first read it. I think I made it read it three times that year. What is your one thing? Now I have to know. <laughs> well, you know, that was so much more about productivity and focusing on the one thing that you had to do. So during tax season, it was focusing on these particular tax returns or because my year is so, my business is so seasonal, it kind of changed 
with the season, but I like just being able to focus on the one thing. I'm one of those people that it's like, oh, look at that shiny object over there. Oh, look at that. I want to do that. I'm going to offer this. And then I have all of these projects started and it's a mess. Mm -hmm. So that really helped rein me in and say, okay, I can have a notebook with all these ideas and things I want to do, but I can focus on this one thing, get it done, totally rock it out and then move on to the next thing. So that was hugely awesome for me. That's right. The next book was, it was by Grant Cardone. Are you familiar with them? Yes, I have followed him a little bit. Um, um, it wasn't Sell or Be Sold. It's, it's oh, oh shoot, what was that? I'm the same way. I can picture it, but I can't come up with the title, right? <laughs> yes, I, I, I can't come up with it right now. It was his book right after Sell or Be Sold. I can't think of what it's called. Google the 10X Rule, I remember now. Say it again. The 10X Rule. The 10X Rule. Okay, yes. I have not read that one. That book, well, I, I read it first, and then I went and listened to it on uh, the audio version because he did his own narration of the book, and he's so excited. Just such an excitable person. You just can't help but be excited listening to his stories. And that book, I learned so much because being an accountant, I'm not into sales. I want to be back in my desk, and I want to left my spreadsheets and my calculator and my computer apps, and and I want to be left alone. Yeah. But being a business owner, you kind of have to get out there and let people know you exist and how you can help them. You have to get comfortable with doing some portion of the sale, even if it's closing leads. You have to be able to be in that sales cycle. So that book was really awesome, helping me just get the confidence to go ahead and be able to close sales and handle the sales side of business. I love that. That's a very good statement, too. And you do have to be... Um, at a minimum, you have to be okay selling yourself and your services. And I think that's a huge hurdle that some women never get over and that kind of prevents them from, you know, kind of moving forward into this space. Um, I know it's something that I've struggled with. Like I've underpriced myself for years mm -hmm. to get clients. Um, I mean, you and I've talked about that before, I think too. I've totally underpriced myself. Um, and that totally has to do with uh, the sales mentality. So good, yeah, good yes. stuff. Okay, so let's see. We're, these interviews are fabulous, and I find I could talk for two hours, but really nobody's going to listen to a two-hour podcast or interview. So moving right. on, <laughs> um, you talked about, um, so we talked about how long it was before you earned your first dollar and how good that was. We hit that question. Were there any mistakes you made that you'd want to warn others to avoid? Yes, trying to be everything to everyone. I have a saying now that I put on my board, when you talk to everyone, you talk to no one. <laughs> I was one of those people that would roll their eyes when you hear the gurus and the experts say, niche down, find a niche, get your niche, and then go and you can kill it. I was always like, yeah, okay, that doesn't work. But it does. And you don't have to be everything to everybody. It's so much easier to have a sales conversation. It's so much easier to write an email or a blog post or a, a Facebook ad or a Google ad when you know exactly who you're talking to and you can speak their language to them, it just, it makes this e business be on like autopilot. It's, yeah. it's so awesome. I wish I would have paid attention in the beginning. I would have eliminated a lot of hurdles. Well, yeah, because I think we get so hungry for um, the income because we're in that scary place that you'll you, like, hey, my first year of business, I did this a lot. Um, you know, I do tech and marketing and stuff. So people are like, do you do this? I'm like, yeah, do you do this? Yeah, like I totally know how to do all that. Should I be right. doing all that? Probably not. And right. so in, in the past few months, I have repackaged my services and upped my prices and it, it feels better because I actually do less sales exploration calls and because only the right people are asking me and almost all of them end up working for me. And if they don't, it's just mutually, we're like, okay with it. Like, oh, well, you're not ready for my services yet. And, it, and there's no there's no bad feeling. There's no me worrying because I'm like the right client's going to come. So that is really, really good advice. Okay. If you don't mind sharing these details, because I didn't ask you this before, but I think it's, I like to talk about numbers because I don't think enough people do it in this space. So like we already talked about the numbers, like how long did it take you to ramp up and get first client? And, you know, cause having those expectations understood when you're in this, um, you know, trying to take this journey, it, it takes a lot of stress out because you're like, 
well, I shouldn't expect a client in 30 days. It might take me three months, right? Right. And when you niche down and you get specific, you don't need 10,000 followers, let alone 100,000, right? You need a few of the right kind. So do you want to share with us like sort of what is your your list size, like that doesn't have to be email list. It could be just your, you know, like your social followers, like what's your kind of network size compared to how many clients you need, you know, like how many clients you take on to keep your business running optimally. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, I do not have a huge list by, by any means. Uh, my email list is probably about 150 people on it. And I'm not a big email person either. Yeah. So that, that works for me. And my social media following across all the channels, maybe about a thousand people. You guys, like everybody better be listening to this because it, that is so achievable for everybody, right? Like if you just find the right people, then, yeah. you know, and okay. And so the, the second part then, how many, how many clients do you serve and like, what's your kind of max and and like, you know, that turn into clients out of all that? Um, well, again, it's different. So of course I get a huge influx at this time of the year because it, it's tax season. So I get a lot more individuals and people that are outside of my niche, but that I can still help. So I am at about a 250 during tax season. And then throughout the year, I, um, I range right around about 50. Okay. That I deal with on a monthly basis. Doing the bookkeeping services. Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So that's, that's amazing. Um, and by the way, thank you for taking time during tax season to do this interview. <laughs> Problem. <laughs> Much appreciate. <laughs> uh, um, okay. So, I mean, when you look at those numbers and it's, it feels way more achievable than somebody, like, I think a lot of what you see out there on the internet is start your own blog, start your own online business. And those are really numbers games where you have to drive like high dollar traffic or, or you have to drive a high volume of traffic to sell a bunch of low dollar products. Right. So the whole sell a $47 ebook, I'm like, eh, you know, you can, but now you need 10,000, 30,000, you know, people following you. But if you have professional services, that you can bill for on a monthly or quarterly basis, then 50 a month is beautiful. Even yeah. you probably start, right? You thought you were gonna start at 10 and you start, and then you went to 25 and then, you right, know. Right. 30 and then like 45, it's like, wow, still growing. It's like this little momentum pace that I'm building. And you, and you didn't want 50 right away, right? Cause that would have like really um, it been a train like wreck. That, <laughs> <laughs> that would yeah. have totally crushed me. That's right. You have to scale up. You have, you have to go, okay. Um, I, what I like to say is get your first client and then get your second client and then get your third client and then rework your systems because now you're juggling three people. And then, you know, how are you going to scale from then? And like in accounting, like in, in, in the bookkeeping world, you know, handling 50 a month totally makes sense. In my world, in, in the marketing and in technology stuff, I only have six ish one-on-one -on -one clients a month because because I invest more time in each one to do the work that I'm doing right than bookkeeping takes um right but yeah okay I love that because this is just so achievable for women like it's such a great yeah. story Definitely. Um, okay is it is there a question we haven't hit yet that you're like I can't wait till Lori asked me that question <laughs> Um, no, we actually, I think we hit on all of them about the mentor. I do want to talk about that. I think yes. That's yes. So, so I like when I was in this space, I was always like, I wish there was that person. Like, I just want to know, like, I just want somebody to like hear my whole business idea and just tell me like, is it going to work? And, you know, kind of give me pointers and tips. And I never found that person. I mean, the closest thing to finding that person I will tell you was B school. Um, Marie Forleo and, and I am full disclosure, B school affiliate because I am a huge B school fan and, um, was, was blessed enough to be featured on Marie's show a couple years ago. And I'm a total believer in the B school thing, but that still wasn't like a one-on-one -on -one mentor. That was a program mentor. So you actually had a mentor mentor in your life. Yes, I did. And he was so awesome. And it was a funny story because 
when I was doing uh, the criminal investigative work, when I was still with the government, I had several cases with the same accountant. When I left, this accountant became my mentor. And he, so he knew me, he knew how I worked and we, you know, would be across the table going back and forth with each other because of his client's cases. So when I left, I called him, I was like, hey, I left, you know, we have a good relationship. Would you mind just helping me get started and being my mentor? And he, absolutely. So we would meet regularly and have conversations and he really helped with, he's like, hey, you have this unique set of skills that just because someone has a CPA license, they don't have your unique set. You need to really do this. And he gave me all these different tactics and techniques from just being able to have a one-on-one -on -one person that can say, this is what you need to do. I tried this, this didn't work, but this does work. Maybe you can twist it and make it into your own thing. It was absolutely phenomenal. A lot of my decisions within my business were made with his assistance. And they've helped me tremendously. Like I'm so eternally grateful to him. I still reach out to him. We, we communicate now and it's like, hey, this is what I'm doing. You know, how are things going? And it's, it's awesome. So I encourage anybody that if you know someone that is in your space that you want to be in or that you're in to get a mentor, it is human, humongous and so important. Totally. Well, and you said something very key there about that. Somebody who's in your space, because, you know, there's a lot of uh, life coaches out there on the internet. I'm trying not to say that with sarcasm, but <laughs> um, there are some fabulous life coaches out there on the internet, but there's also you know, some not so fabulous. And um, somehow that industry right now is just booming. And I think it's because we all have that, that desire. Like, I just want to ask somebody, like, I just want somebody to validate me. I just, I got this important decision to make and I don't want to walk through it alone. Um, and entrepreneurship can be quite lonely. So um, the key is really finding somebody who is in your space, who's been there and done that, who, you know, has business wisdom and good discernment and, um, you know, a desire, and, and here's another thing, there's nothing in it for them. Like the best mentors that I've had are, they're just doing it because they've reached some level of success in their life that they just want to give back and pour into somebody who's not there yet. That's awesome. Um, there's been some wrong partnerships I've, I've gone into thinking they would mentor me. And in the end, it was a very self-serving relationship. And now I'm much more discerning, right, about <laughs> how to pick those people, but finding somebody that's been in your space. So um, I like how it was even somebody that you had a contact from in the corporate world, right? Mm -hmm. Because the government world in your case. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the same. Yeah, yeah, we're following, we're following. Okay, that's, that is fabulous advice. So, um, hey, I think, I think we have covered a lot and I think your story is very um, inspirational for women who are looking to break out of what they're doing in the day to day and have more freedom to be home with their kids. Um, and yeah, it's just wonderful. So any last parting advice? Take time for yourself. Yes. When you're a business owner, especially as a woman, if you're a mother and you have all these different things and responsibilities that pull at you and your business, you get obsessed with it because it's your baby too. So you want to give it all the time and attention that you can. But if you don't have anything to pull from, you can't give anything valuable. So make sure you take time for yourself. Your business will love you because of it. That is super good because you said that before. It's easy to obsess on your business because you love the work it doesn't even feel like work. I'm working in my zone of genius, right? And it feels so great. But I've sort of learned that I can go about 10 days and then things start to fall apart in different ways. And, and I need to take a break. I need to just, you know, catch up on laundry maybe is sometimes just. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, I'm gonna cook dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you're actually going to eat. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I totally agree and appreciate that because it can feel like your work is, is your hobby. And I love, like, I will read business books 24 seven. <laughs> and sometimes said, like I'm reading this and my husband's like, give me your phone. No, no more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually just made a bold move and took Facebook off my phone. Um, it I'm was, not, I'm close. 
<laughs> well, to be honest, if I need to get at it, I still go through the browser. <laughs> but <laughs> it's way less convenient than just having that icon right there. And right. Um, notifications pop up and you're like, who's that? Who said something to me? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So, no, I, I totally get that. That's great advice. And by the way, we all left our day job so we could have more balance and time with our families and kids. And um, even as entrepreneurs, I think sometimes you end up working more hours and that's not, that's not the healthiest route. Like the point is the four hour work week, right? Like I know some people have that life. I have not designed a business model that is a four hour work week. But I, but I have designed a business model that if I didn't want to scale and I only wanted to work nine to three, Monday through Friday, and not take on any more clients, then I could totally do that and have evenings and weekends completely free or take a month off in the summer, right? When everybody's home. Yes, absolutely. That's my goal. When tax season is over, I'm taking three weeks off and enjoy my kids. It lines right up with their spring break. So it's perfect. I have to tell you real quick. Yeah. You know you're working too much when your son fixes you a plate and brings it to you and says, Mom, I'm worried that you're working too much and you're not eating. We learned about stress today and health. You have to stop. I think that's a sign. That's a sign. How old is he? He's 12. Oh, my. Yes. Yes. Hey, it's, it's, this is a whole, a whole different interview we could keep going off on, but... Um, the example we set for our kids being moms who work for ourselves and what they see, you know, they know I'm on a client call or they know that, um, you know, when there's a snow day, that's a problem for us and, and for you too in Chicago, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I was, if this was a snow day today, I'd be like, Hey, I'm recording an interview right now. Don't run back and forth in front of those windows right there. <laughs> exactly. I have a sign on my door. It's like caution. Mom is working. They need to know, they need to, but they see that. And it's a great example of look what you can do for yourself. So absolutely, absolutely. I love it. This was a great, great discussion. Um, Seneca, because you're a real girl, like that's what I call myself. I'm just a real girl. Like, you know, cause people are like, oh, you got, all, you got this Facebook page, you got this, just no, I'm just a real girl. You're just a real girl. And we've built these great businesses that work for our families. So absolutely. thank you for being on the show. And anybody who has not yet the step-by-step -step workbook to how you can quit your corporate job and run a profitable business from home is at howshequits.com and look for the download there and we will see you on the next show. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lori. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.